Good morning, and welcome to the Palliative Care Friday Chalk Talks. Today, we are talking about social model hospice homes, and we are lucky to be joined by three authors of the recent publication in the Journal of Palliative Medicine, which is titled Social Model Hospice Homes, Bridging the Gap in End-of-Life Care Delivery. So I have three of our guests introduced. First, we have Kelly Scott. Um, she, in a previous life, was a hospice nurse, but is more recently the executive director and founder of Clare House in Oklahoma, which is a social model hospice. And nationally, she serves as the president of the Omega Home Network and provides consulting and mentoring to aspiring social model hospices. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Second, we have Dr. Jennifer Clark. She is a physician and healthcare delivery scientist serving in various roles as a clinician educator, administrator, and innovator at the local, national, and international levels. She's connected to the Clare House in her role as a volunteer and nationally and internationally. She works with various organizations dedicated to fostering innovative approaches to closing health and education disparities across the globe. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Absolutely. And third, we have Amy Cleaver, not Amy Kluwer, which I <laughs> intentionally asked ahead of time. Apparently it is German, is Amy Cleaver. <laughs> Amy is a current fourth year medical student at the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine in Oklahoma City. And during her undergraduate career, she completed research for her thesis at Clare House on the topic of social model hospice homes. So welcome, Amy. Hello, thank you. Absolutely. So our format for today is going to be two parts. We've got a discussion of about five questions, which might take 20 minutes, give or take. And then we hope to have just a few moments at the end for audience to ask questions if they'd like. So we'll jump right in. Um, our first question really focuses on my ignorance, just to understand a topic that is that's newer to me, and perhaps is unfamiliar to some of you folks as well. So um, three things. Can you help us to understand what are these social model hospice homes? Why do they exist? And then how are they different and collaborative with the metal, uh, the medical model of hospice? I'll Kelly. jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in and answer that. Um, a social model hospice home is a community home for dying people. It's known by different names across the country. On the um, East Coast, they refer to them as comfort care homes. Um, very few of us um, actually call ourselves a hospice because we're not that medical model that most people understand. So you'll see um, our names not using that word, but the model itself we refer to as a social model as contrasted with a medical model. And we sit outside the healthcare system. We are all nonprofits. Um, we provide a home and 24 seven care like a family member would if they were able. We form and exist to address that caregiver crisis in the final weeks of care. And it's a collaborative service with medical models. So every person that lives in a social model hospice home is also enrolled in a medical hospice program because that medical hospice provides the case management, the hospice nurse, the social worker, the chaplain, the home health aide, um, the medications related to the terminal illness, the medical equipment, all of that um, that is part of traditional hospice in this country is provided by that medical hospice. And what we provide is the gap. We fill that gap that nobody else pays for, which is the caregiver and the home. And it's very um, specific. It's very, we observe our boundaries very carefully, but we are simply becoming home and family to people that don't have that support available. It is truly final days care. So most of us set a prognosis for as criteria for admission of around a month or so. Some homes say three months, um, a few homes even say six months, but uh, the upshot is we're not about long-term care. We are about that caregiver crisis in the final days, whether we call that a month or three months. Does that make sense? <laughs> Anything you want to add, Jen? I don't think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, 
having grown up as a hospice and palliative medicine physician, when I moved to Tulsa 13 years ago and heard about Claire House, I was immediately like, oh, this is another inpatient office unit, right? It is not. Um, uh, it is, as Kelly said, an extension of the family and the community and doesn't sit within the traditional model, doesn't of, you know, of healthcare, it doesn't get reimbursed the same way. So it not only serves as the crisis, you know, kind of serve you know, the crisis of end of life care that is, that is unfortunately defined by healthcare in the United States, but it also does this other beautiful thing that, that Amy was able to write about that um, offers this idea that when, when dying and death is done in community, um, it does a profound thing for the people involved. They're able to begin grieving, um, you know, particularly through the bereavement and mourning periods of the loss and making me making meaning and sense of it in a way that we have not been able to see in other end of life care, you know, kind of delivery systems. And so, um, so not only does it, you know, serve as a, as a crisis, you know, kind of solution, um, but it also has this innovative, really beautiful part of it that, that welcomes dying in community again. That's beautiful. Can can I ask you just to briefly elaborate a little bit on boundaries? You mentioned that word and gave it quite a bit of emphasis, Kelly. Yeah. So it's to make this work, we partner with these medical hospices and we try to um, keep everybody in their lane. So most of the caregivers in social model hospice homes are not licensed professionals. They're, and, and that's one of our values is that this kind of loving and compassionate care can be provided by lay people. Under the support of professionals, lay people can do this and empowering people to take that back on as a community is a, is an important value for us. And so we're not prescribing, we're not calling the physicians for orders. We are working collaboratively with the hospice, but we are not telling them how to do their job. We rely on them for that medical management. And that keeps us out of trouble because a lot of us are not licensed or regulated. We don't have to be because we don't charge for our services. Um, and so we're, we're not a skilled nursing facility. We're um, not able to do things like you would do at a nursing home. And we don't want to because hospice is being reimbursed to do that. That's another value for us economically is we don't do things that someone else is being paid to provide. So it helps us manage our money as a charity organization. We have to raise every dime we spend. So if the hospice nurse is expected to come out at two o'clock in the morning and put a Foley in, the hospice nurse does that. We don't provide a nurse in the house that does that. So just like a family would at home, we let them practice their case management while we provide that family care. Okay. And all volunteerism? So, sorry, I, so many follow-up questions before we even get to number two. Um, no, most of us have 24-7 staffing yeah. because it's just really difficult to rely on volunteers for 24-7 staffing, but yeah. we supplement the care yeah. with volunteers who may do hands-on bedside care. They may do companionship. They do cooking, cleaning, laundry, all those things that it takes to run a big, busy household our volunteers help with. And then we have this wonderful luxury of having this community resource of people who are gifted in a variety of ways, whether they're massage therapists or musicians or pet therapy handlers. Um, they provide spiritual support. They provide yoga classes. Whatever gifts someone has and wants to share, we love to welcome that into our homes. That's great. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Claire House itself and the community that it serves. We are celebrating our 20th anniversary. Um, we formed in 2003 as a solution to this caregiver crisis. There was nothing like us to emulate. So we literally had a vision, saw a problem, had a vision, and then made it up as we went along. And it's been successful for two decades. We grew from a three-bedroom rented apartment to a beautiful six-acre, ten-bedroom campus. So we started small. We proved the need. We proved that the vision could work. And uh, we grew our fundraising, our donor base, our referral base over all these years. So now we are a seasoned nonprofit with um, a strong presence locally, regionally, and nationally. We lead the nation in fostering the startup of homes like this. 
And um, we have a huge component of education because we believe that people need help in learning how to navigate the healthcare system and serious illness. And we're able to spend resources teaching the community how to do that, as well as we, we are a clinical rotation site for nursing students and um, medical students and residents so that they can come and experience an end of life environment hands-on, see our culture, um, our values, and really get to experience um, death and dying. Hmm. Somebody dies in our house almost every day. Most nursing and medical students don't see that, but at our home, they get to experience that hands-on. Can I add something to this about the community, just so that, that you know, kind of people who read CAPSI and any of the other palliative care data knows that Oklahoma's in the bottom five um, we jockey for the bottom three typically in um, access to uh, hospice and palliative care resources, particularly um, clinicians. Um, and unfortunately, you know, kind of with lots of effort, we're, we're just behind the curve. And we've grown from three of us 10 years ago to well over 40 of us that are practicing across the state with our, you know, APRNs and physicians alike. Um, you know, it was it's hard to do this work in our environment. And I don't think we could have done the work that we've done without the model, without the social model hospice home, because Claire House gave us the focal point and kind of Switzerland, if you will, with regards to the universities and things like that, um, to be deliver end of life care education, particularly in a place where it was hands-on, direct experience with, um, with with dying and seeing what it looks like in community. So, and I know Amy can speak to that direct experience as a student and then also um, as a researcher and the, and the phenomenon related to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was going off what Dr. Clark said. There's, I think a quote that really sticks out to me is I was speaking to someone who was a guest at the house at the time and they said, I've just never died before. And I think that was such an eye-opening thing for me as a student, but also kind of to realize dying is such an individual and important experience that as a medical student, they don't ever really talk about dying. It's more of, okay, how do, what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? And they didn't really talk about what do you happen when you get to the end? Um, and so I think kind of what Dr. Kelly and Dr. Clark have both mentioned, the education aspect of Claire House really brings in the entire community, but also the family. And so a lot of the people that I had the opportunity to interview with, they really mentioned, they just didn't know what the dying process looked like. They didn't know that there comes a point where people just may not want to eat. There may come a point where it's difficult to swallow. And there are things that we can help to kind of with this process and what that looks like. And it, it educates not just me, not just uh, medical students, but also those who are kind of in the dying process. And I think that's why it's so important when why you have, or why Claire House has so many volunteers coming back who are actually people who are family members of guests who would have previously died there is because it was such an impactful experience for them that they know the importance of what it was like to receive care there. And they wanna come back and help and be able to kind of provide that same level of compassion that they had received. Thank you. So uh, naturally, when I'm reading articles, I'm thinking about skeptics, and I'm sure there are skeptics out in the community and out in the healthcare system. What are some of the more common concerns, questions, skepticisms that are raised about the social model, and how do you guys assuage those skeptics? I think... Um, it we don't encounter that as much anymore because we have such a strong reputation and history within the community. But for sure. startups, the biggest um, skeptics are medical hospices, <laughs> which seems crazy, but makes total sense because it's a very competitive industry. You know, um, hospice started in this country as a volunteer service. It was really a, a mission of uh, volunteer compassion within a community, and now it has evolved into a booming industry. In our community, because Oklahoma is not a certificate of need state for hospices, we have over 100 programs in uh, northeastern Oklahoma. It is 
crazy insane and the competition is intense and so for a lot of places that are like that you're just another startup hospice and people don't understand the difference of course um they think that we're just another hospice with a funky name and they don't really get that that we're not competitive we're collaborative and uh, you know we in the beginning we had hospices that called the health department and reported us trying to get us in trouble because they thought we you know we were a medical hospice program operating without a license so um i think that's a barrier for startups when people want to bring this idea to their community one of the first barriers they have to get past is to the medical hospices, you want us here. We're going to make your life easier. We're going to give better quality care for your patients and you want us here, but they got to understand that before they welcome us in. A couple of the other things are just overcoming knowledge gaps. Like so many of my colleagues don't understand the what the gap is, what the social gap is in the end of life. And so um, they get really confused with, in, you know, kind of how does this fit in if I'm a, you know, an inpatient, you know, kind of team, whether it be hospital subspecialty or even a palliative medicine team, how do you fit into like, you know, inpatient units or skilled nursing or, you know, kind of just the basic understanding of what the model does and its role. Um, it surprises me <laughs> how I have to kind of, there, you know, kind of like, okay, here are the basic, here's the basic healthcare system, right? This is where, th this is what it is. Do you know and see this huge gap that happens, this cliff um, that families are left to deal with, you know, following the diaspora of the family across the globe, you know, people don't have a social network anymore. And we have more and more people, particularly with income inequality growing at rapid rates, that there are people that don't even have a home with which to feel safe in their last days, hours, weeks of life. And um, and so, yeah, it's that that's the other piece is, you know, kind of when we do the ed when we've done this education piece the first kind of decade was really like pulling death out of the taboo <laughs> you know and really talking about it as a normal part of human life and then the second part of it is oh gosh i had no idea because we didn't talk about death i didn't realize what the problems were and the gaps in the care and the potential of innovation around that experience and how powerful it can be and so we're moving into a new kind of um educational experience that goes beyond just bringing you know bringing us out of the valley of the shadow of death you know kind of like that whole more you know kind of morbid taboo that has been in american culture that you know, kind of we've been able to influence that to the point now where we can talk about dying as a powerful, powerful, transformative human experience. And and I think there's also that barrier of people who have preconceived notions about death and dying, about hospice, about um, morphine, and they have it in their either in their experience or what they read on Facebook or whatever that hospice is just going to kill people and once you start morphine death is going to come immediately and so we have these these huge misconceptions to overcome um, as part of an education process within the lay community yeah I remember the first time I went out as a fellow to do home hospice and I remember meeting a gentleman who greeted me at the door and said are you here to euthanize my wife and uh, yeah, this is pervasive everywhere. That's for sure. Um, for those of us that want to learn more, looking for something nearby, how common are these social models? And how do you suggest we even begin to search? So the Omega Home Network is a great resource for that. It's omegahomenetwork.org. We um, have a hundred member homes and developing projects across the country. And uh, they're about 45 open homes and 55 homes in development. Mm -hmm. And we support and mentor those new projects as they find us and come to us for assistance. So if you go to that website and click on the homes page, there is a map with pins on it and it shows every existing home, every home in development. Um, and I think we're in about 27 states across the nation right now. So you can easily find a home on that page on the um, network website. Perfect. And then one last question before we open it up to see if the audience has anything. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about the Omega Home Network? Is this all connected? Is it standardized? Do people get the freedom to do what they want to do with these social models? Um, I don't know. 
Well, it, you know, it was interesting 20, 22 years ago when I first started this project and started thinking about it, I looked online and really couldn't find anything to emulate. Um, but as time has passed and internet searches have enabled um, better accuracy, I've been able to locate homes that are even older than Claire House. There are homes um, in New York, in Ohio, in Santa Barbara that are 25, 30, 35 years old. So that's the other really affirming thing about the model itself is that across the country, people encountered this problem, this caregiver crisis and envisioned the same solution and made it happen. And it's been working for decades. All of this independent of any support, any kind of network or support system. And what we've tried to do over the last 10 years is connect people. So when we find a home through searching or somebody shoots us an email and says, have you looked at this home in this state, uh, we'll look it up, we'll reach out to them, we'll say, hey, you sound just like us, you're talking our language, your structure is just like us, do you know about this network and would you like to join and, and be a part of this community and support? And then people find us and they, they through internet searches, they will find us and they will find a home in their region, they'll go do a site visit and they'll say, this is what I want to do, I want to bring this to my community, will you help me? And that's our whole purpose is to foster the development and growth and sustainability of these homes across the nation. Marty, can I just real quick? Please. Marty, Marty knows he, he tries <laughs> to control my audio and video, so I won't get on in <laughs> many time, but here I am anyway. <laughs> Dr. Clark, I just want to say it's great to see you. I saw you, I think, most recently on Echoes during the COVID era, and so it's good to see you again. But <laughs> uh, like I said in the chat, I won't get into this, but I I'm the one that asked about contact info and I may be, I'm in Missouri and uh, I may be uh, actually driving down to Oklahoma to see that because I'm uh, 30 plus years uh, in hospice and I just love and the, the fact that it is bridging a gap and Dr. Clark, what you said, it I, I get that, that people in the healthcare system, our colleagues don't get that there's a gap. It's hard for me to conceptualize too, but uh, this has just got me uh, excited, energized, and uh, looking for more information. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anytime we um, we you know kind of are you know as the volunteer you know kind of as Kelly said, everybody's got a skill set. Mine just happens to be hospice and palliative medicine, but my primary role as a physician is actually education and to round out the interdisciplinary team at the house and be a resource to my colleagues. Um, and so I spend a day a week just laying hands and, and being part of the team. And so would be, we have attendings as well as medical students, residents, pharmacy, APR, and all sorts of different students running through the house um, and attendings who are lifelong learners have come in and, and been a part of our work. And so anybody and everybody is welcome. We'd love to have you come down Highway 44 and, and, and come take a visit in Tulsa. There are also two homes open in Missouri. So mm -hmm. Columbia, Missouri and Joplin have open operating social model hospice homes. You guys have certain uh, hospice agencies you partner with? One of the values is that we are open to everyone in the community. And this is a really distinct difference between a medical inpatient hospice unit or freestanding residential hospice house and a social model hospice, because generally those Medicare reimbursed houses are owned and operated by one specific hospice or hospital program. And you have to be enrolled in that hospice to access that service. So they're not universally accessible to everyone in the community, because if you're enrolled in a different hospice, you can't get into that house. We are open to anyone. Um, that is one of our values. We do have um, what we call provider agreements with hospices in the community so that they understand who we are, what we do, what we don't do, but we don't have contracts. There's no um, money that changes hands between the social model and the medical model. Their contract is with the patient themselves who sign their admission paperwork, but it we will take care of people that are enrolled in any hospice in the community. So at any given time, we may be working with 10 different hospice programs. Gotcha. One more question popped up. So uh, Sarah asks, 
having so many medical people come through your houses, how do you negotiate boundaries since you're not licensed to provide the medical care? We talk about that all the time. We're very clear with the hospices about what we do and what we don't do. It's part of that provider agreement. Um, we insist on certain things. And part of it is ensuring that um, quality continuity of care during a transition. So if someone's coming from the hospital to Claire House, we got to know what we're getting into. So that referral process is very specific. We have to make sure we can meet those needs. We're a non-skilled home, so they can't be on IVs. They can't need injections. They can't be on BiPAP or have a feeding tube or need blood sugar management. It truly is comfort care only. It's not medical type care, skilled nursing. And, and this home is an option for people who have opted to let nature take its course and pursue comfort care only. So we're doing that supportive care. It doesn't require a 24 seven medical person and the hospice knows that. So that nurse is making her visits a couple times a week up to daily during the active dying phase. They know that if we got a question with medication, we're going to call them. We're not making changes on our own. We're following the regimen that they give us. And we're just very disciplined about that. And we hold them accountable. Like I said, if we need a Foley in the middle of the night, we call hospice to put it in. If we need dressing changes, we call hospice to do that. Um, they know that they're going to continue to provide their full breadth of services in our home, just like they would in a, a home in the community. I like, I like the question that popped up in the chat. So it's asking about respite, though I wonder if it goes both ways. Do you guys offer respite for other families? But since you technically are the family, do you ever use respite and send people to like inpatient hospice facilities? Um, we, it doesn't go that way, but okay. we do offer respite. When we don't have somebody, we generally have a waiting list, but if we don't have a waiting list, then we will offer our beds for respite. This is a community resource. We want every bed day utilized mm -hmm. as much as possible. So if we don't have end of life guests waiting, then we'll send out a notice to our hospice providers and say, hey, we've got two beds open. We're happy to do respite if somebody needs it. And we feel like that's very much part of our mission because providing hospice at home is really hard work and people get exhausted and they need a break. And if by coming to our house for a five day stay, taking a break, getting some rest, maybe taking a trip or taking care of medical needs, then they're able to take their loved one back home and continue home hospice to the end. We see that as a win. We've helped them achieve their goals, which is a huge part of our individualized care is helping people meet their goals for how they want their death to happen and what values and preferences they have during their final days. All part of that that mission to serve the community. Yeah, beautiful. All right. We're just about at time. So Kelly, Jennifer, Amy, we appreciate your time today. We appreciate you educating us a little bit more about this. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you all. Thank you.